Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 342 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about exorcism. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and join me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Cultures all over the world report people being possessed by evil spirits, and they have rites that are used to expel these spirits. In a Christian context, the spirits are typically understood to be demons or fallen angels, and the most famous rite used to expel them is exorcism. For hundreds of years, the Catholic Church had a variety of exorcism rites, But in 1614, and again in 1998, the church published official rights for the procedure. What does the church teach on this topic? And what do the two official rights of exorcism actually say? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin? While demons and exorcism can be a scary topic for some people, we will not be dwelling on the scary aspects in this episode. As always, we will be keeping things clinical and not sensationalizing matters. For example, even though there are videos of exorcisms out there on the internet, either performed by Catholics or others, we won't be playing any clips for them. We'll be keeping everything cool and low-key. In fact, if anything, our treatment will be more serene and academic in tone than anything else. So the great majority of listeners shouldn't have a problem, shouldn't have anything to worry about. But if you or someone in your family is particularly sensitive, you can use your discretion. So what will we be talking about today? Basically, today's show is going to look at the church's official documents regarding exorcism, such as the 1614 and 1998 rites of exorcism. This will give us an understanding of the church's present teaching and discipline regarding exorcism, and that will give us a foundation for discussing exorcism in future shows. For example, I plan to do episodes on the history of exorcism, including exorcism in the Bible, and I also plan to look at particular cases of exorcism, uh, beliefs and practices in in the past didn't always correspond to how things are done now, but today we lay a foundation on the church's present understanding and practice. I know you've been asked before if you've ever participated in an exorcism. Have you? No, I haven't participated in the rite itself. If I was ever in an emergency circumstance, I'd do what Christ called me to and trust him to give me what I need. But apart from emergencies, I'll leave the ministry to others and stick with the ministry that God has called me to on a regular basis. However, while I haven't participated in the actual rite of exorcism, I have been asked to consult on exorcism cases. In fact, one day while I was writing this script, I had a video chat with a priest about an exorcism case that he was seeking my advice about, which was one of the things that led me to start working on this script. I've also consulted with exorcists about various matters, meaning I contacted them to ask questions, and I've been consulted by exorcists, meaning they wanted to ask me questions. And the exorcist community is rather more ecumenical than you might suppose. For example, groups of exorcists that were founded by Catholics now include Orthodox and Anglican exorcists, and I've personally spoken about exorcism with experts who are Catholic, Orthodox, and Anglican. Because no matter what communion you belong to, you still need to help people who are oppressed by the devil, and I'm happy to do whatever I can to help. However, today we're going to be focusing on Catholic belief and practice. Then where do you want to start? Although we're going to be focusing on the two rites of exorcism that are currently used in the Latin rite of the Church, I want to start with what the Catechism of the Catholic Church has to say, because it's the most recent, general, and authoritative statement on the Church's belief. There are two passages in particular that pertain to exorcisms today. First, there's paragraph 1237, which describes part of the rite of baptism and says... Since baptism signifies liberation from sin and from its instigator, the devil, one or more exorcisms are pronounced over the candidate. The celebrant then anoints him with the oil of catechumens or lays his hands on him, and he explicitly renounces Satan. Thus prepared, he is able to confess the faith of the church, to which he will be entrusted by baptism. 
So there is an exorcism that is actually performed in baptism. This is not an essential part of the rite of baptism, but it's something that was added in the early centuries, as we'll discuss when we talk about the history of exorcism in the future. However, the kind of exorcism that takes place in baptism is not what most of us think of as an exorcism. That difference is mentioned in the other paragraph in the catechism, where the subject of exorcism is explored more fully. It appears in the section on sacramentals. So exorcism is a sacramental, not a sacrament, meaning that it's a rite that operates through the intercession of the church rather than by a divine promise like the sacraments do. The passage in question says, When the church asks publicly and authoritatively in the name of Jesus Christ that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion, it is called exorcism. Jesus performed exorcisms, and from him the church has received the power and office of exorcising. In a simple form, exorcism is performed at the celebration of baptism. The solemn exorcism, called a major exorcism, can be performed only by a priest and with the permission of the bishop. The priest must proceed with prudence, strictly observing the rules established by the church. Exorcism is directed at the expulsion of demons or to the liberation from demonic possession through the spiritual authority which Jesus entrusted to his church. Illness, especially psychological illness, is a very different matter. Treating this is the concern of medical science. Therefore, before an exorcism is performed, it is important to ascertain that one is dealing with the presence of the evil one and not an illness. So this paragraph provides a basic definition of what an exorcism is. It's a rite by which the church publicly and authoritatively asks that a person or object be protected from demons or withdrawn from their dominion. The paragraph notes the two types of exorcism. One, which it refers to as simple exorcism, occurs in baptism. The, Catholic, the catechism doesn't mention it, but simple exorcisms or minor exorcisms, as they're popularly called, can also be performed in other circumstances. The second type of exorcism is one that the catechism says is more solemn, and it's called a major exorcism. This is the one that we normally think of. In the Catholic Church, major exorcisms can be done only by a priest who has the permission of his bishop. And the catechism goes out of its way to note that exorcisms are not to be used when a person has an illness, especially a psychological illness, because many people suffering from psychological illnesses can think or suspect that they are possessed, or others may believe or suspect that they are possessed, when in reality the symptoms are just due to a psychological or other medical condition. What's the next text you'd like to look at? It's a letter that the then Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued in 1985. This was just two years after the 1983 Code of Canon Law came out, and there were some questions about how to interpret the law at the time. The document was signed by then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict XVI, and it stated, Recent years have seen an increase in the number of prayer groups in the Church aimed at seeking deliverance from the influence of demons while not actually engaging in real exorcisms. These meetings are led by lay people, even when a priest is present. As the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has been asked how one should view these facts, this dicastery considers it necessary to inform bishops of the following response. 1. Canon 1172 of the Code of Canon Law states that no one can legitimately perform exorcisms over the possessed, unless he has obtained special and express permission from the local ordinary, and states that this permission should be granted by the local ordinary only to priests who are endowed with piety, knowledge, prudence, and integrity of life. Bishops are therefore strongly advised to stipulate that these norms be observed. The law expressed in this canon from the Code of Canon Law was subsequently modified, but the substance of what it says remains the same as we'll see. In other words, only priests who have been given special permission by the bishop can perform major exorcisms.
The next point that the letter makes concerns an exorcistic prayer that was written by Pope Leo XIII and published in 1890. This is not the same as the famous prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, which he also wrote. The prayer to St. Michael the Archangel begins, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. It is not an exorcism, and it came out several years later, and it was designed to be said, among other places, at the end of the low mass back in the day. However, the exorcism that Pope Leo wrote begins, O most glorious prince of the heavenly hosts, St. Michael the Archangel. This one is an exorcism. It was published as an appendix to the 1614 rite of exorcism. It was called the exorcism against Satan and the fallen angels, and it was designed to be said by priests. Back over to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. 2. From these prescriptions, it follows that it is not even licit that the faithful use the formula of exorcism against Satan and the fallen angels, extracted from the one published by order of the Supreme Pontiff Leo XIII, and even less that they use the integral text of this exorcism. Bishops should take care to warn the faithful, if necessary, of this. So while laity can say the St. Michael prayer, they are not to say either extracts from or the whole of the exorcism prayer Pope Leo wrote. Nevertheless, there has continued to be a lot of confusion and abuse on this point. In his book, The History of Exorcism, Adam Bly writes, There is one rubric and one footnote in the Minor Exorcism of 1890. The rubric is, The following exorcism can be used by bishops as well as by priests who have this authorization from their ordinary. There has been considerable violation of the rubric for the Minor Exorcism of 1890 in the form of lay people using it. Instances occurred where the rubric was removed and the rite disseminated online without it. In some cases, lay people were encouraged to use it. When lay people use this rite, it is illicit and invalid, as they do not have permission, and they do not have the priestly faculty necessary to use the rite if they had permission. So no matter what you read on the internet, you are not supposed to say this exorcism if you're a layperson, just as the CDF said back in 1985, and you should content yourself with saying the prayer to St. Michael. Now to the third and final point the CDF makes. 3. Finally, for the same reasons, bishops are asked to be vigilant so that, even in cases that do not concern true demonic possession, those who are without the due faculty may not conduct meetings during which invocations to obtain release are uttered, in which demons are questioned directly and their identity sought to be known. So the CDF doesn't want people who do not have the faculty to conduct an exorcism, which would mean all laypersons, to conduct meetings in which they question the demons directly, including about their identities. So don't start asking demons questions in deliverance meetings, even when a full possession isn't present. Finally, the congregation states... Drawing attention to these norms, however, should in no way distance the faithful from praying that, as Jesus taught us, they may be delivered from evil. Finally, pastors may take this opportunity to recall what the tradition of the church teaches concerning the role proper to the sacraments and the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of the angels and saints, in the Christian's spiritual battle against evil spirits. So they do want the faithful praying for deliverance from evil and relying on the intercession of the Virgin Mary and the saints and angels. Now, let's talk about exorcism itself. Where does the word come from? It's from Greek roots. In Greek, ex means out of and horkizo means I swear or I take an oath. So based on its roots, exorcism would mean to solemnly swear or utter an oath to drive out a spirit from someone. But it's come to mean saying a set of prayers to get the spirit out of someone. I also should mention another term that comes up in discussions of exorcism, and that's the term energumen. 
The term energumen means a possessed person. It also comes from Greek roots. The Greek verb energeo means I work or I influence. So an energumen means a person who is under the influence of a spirit, someone a spirit's working on. Or in modern terms, it means a possessed person. You may sometimes hear me use the term energumen just for variation so I don't have to keep saying possessed person or demoniac over and over again. If possession involves spirits, what kind of spirits are we talking about? Is it just demons? Demons are certainly what exorcists are typically dealing with. However, exorcists do sometimes report a spirit claiming to be a human being. For example, a spirit possessing a person might say it's Judas or Nero. And there's a division of opinion in the exorcistic community about whether such spirits are telling the truth. Some hold that it's really a demon who is lying about who it is and claiming to be a human, while others are open to the possibility that it could be a damned soul possessing someone. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas said that by God's special permission, uh, the souls of the damned can uh, manifest themselves in human affairs. The church doesn't have a definite teaching on this matter, so it's a matter of speculation. In either case, the thing to do is pursue the exorcism and get the spirit out. Do demons only possess people or can they possess other things? Demons can possess other things. And as a helpful guide, I've previously classified the different types of demonic activity that have been reported and grouped them into nine different kinds of activity. Type 1 is subliminal demonic activity. This is where a demon is doing something, but you don't have evidence that would let you detect the demon with confidence. This is the case, for example, with most ordinary temptation, when you can't tell if the temptation is being produced by a demon or by something else, like the bad example of others, which is classically called the world, or our own disordered desires, which are classically called the flesh, because in the standard way of understanding things, the devil is only one possible cause of temptation alongside the world and the flesh. Type 2 activity is where the demonic presence is ambiguous. That is, you have some evidence that a demon may be involved, but the evidence isn't conclusive. Type 3 activity is where it becomes conclusive, and this type is known as infestation. This occurs when a demon is targeting something other than a human, such as a place, an object or an animal. So if it's a place, an object or an animal that the demon is targeting, it's infestation. Type four activity is what you could call impersonation. This is where a demon is manifesting and pretending to be something other than what it is. Like we read about in 1 John 4, where it says that we're not to trust the spirits, but test them because they all aren't from God. And similarly, the New Testament says the devil disguises himself as an angel of light, so that would be impersonation. Type 5 activity is called oppression, and this occurs when a demon is targeting something in a person's life that is external to him, like trying to harm his reputation, work, finances, or property. Type 6 activity is called vexation, which is when the demon attacks the person's body, causing illness, injuries, or disabilities like deafness and muteness. Type 7 activity is called obsession, which is where the demon attacks the person's mind, causing mental illness or extraordinary temptations. Type 8 activity is standard possession, where the demon, at least at times, seizes control of the person and acts through him, manifesting an alternate personality. And type 9 activity is called subjugation or perfect possession, in which the demon possesses the person with the person's full and deliberate consent, which is really creepy. You said that the Latin church has two official rites of exorcism, one of which was published in 1614 and one of which was published in 1998. What was exorcism like before these rites? It took a number of different forms, as we'll discuss in our future episode on the history of exorcism, but basically there was no standard form of the rite. Instead, there were a variety of exorcisms that were in use, and you didn't have to be a priest to perform one. Often, they were performed by saints or people who were regarded as living saints. 
However, after the Council of Trent, the church decided that it needed to give more guidance to exorcists, and in 1612, Pope Paul V appointed a commission to create a book known as the Roman Ritual, which would contain various rituals for use in the church. It was published in 1614, and one of the rituals it contained was a rite of exorcism. Still, this exorcism was only recommended for use at the time. It didn't suppress other local rites of exorcism, and so it wasn't mandatory when it was first released. It also was modified over time, like when Pope Leo XIII added an exorcism involving St. Michael as an appendix in 1890. But the document itself didn't receive a major revision until 1998. And let's talk about the 1614 Rite of Exorcism. What edition of it will we be using? We'll be using a version of it that was published in the early 1960s, so it reflects pretty much the final form before the revision in 1998. And this version is still in use today. Earlier versions have been suppressed. At the beginning of the rite, there is a general introduction listing the rules for the exorcism. The first rule states, 1. A priest, who is expressly and particularly authorized by the ordinary, when he intends to perform an exorcism over persons tormented by the devil, must be properly distinguished for his piety, prudence, and integrity of life. He should fulfill this devout undertaking in all constancy and humility being utterly immune to any striving for human aggrandizement, and relying not on his own, but on the divine power. Moreover, he ought to be of mature years, and revered not alone for his office, but for his moral qualities. So this version says that an exorcist is to be a priest expressly and particularly authorized by the ordinary, which normally means the local bishop. And it gives the qualifications that the bishop should look for in appointing a priest to function as an exorcist. The next rule states, 2. In order to exercise his ministry rightly, he should resort to a great deal more study of the matter, which has to be passed over here for the sake of brevity, by examining approved authors and cases from experience. On the other hand, let him carefully observe a few more important points enumerated here. So the text says that the exorcist needs to do further study of this type of ministry, relying both on reputable authors and cases drawn from from experience or case histories. But the document will go on to list some of the most important points that need to be attended to. 3. Especially, he should not believe too readily that a person is possessed by an evil spirit, but he ought to ascertain the signs by which a person possessed can be distinguished from one who is suffering from some illness, especially one of a psychological nature. So the text informs the exorcist that he shouldn't believe that a person is possessed too easily. He needs to take a skeptical but open attitude towards the case, and he especially needs to employ diagnostic criteria that will distinguish between a person who is genuinely possessed from a person who has an illness, especially a psychological illness. The document then goes on to give examples of the kinds of signs that can indicate demonic possession. Signs of possession may be the following. Ability to speak with some facility in a strange tongue, or to understand it when spoken by another. The faculty of divulging future and hidden events. Display of powers which are beyond the subject's age and natural condition and various other indications which, when taken together as a whole, build up the evidence. These criteria are based on some that were proposed by the Jesuit author Peter Thyracus in 1589. They're in a different order, but they're substantially the same. First, they include the ability to speak in a foreign language with some felicity, meaning more than just knowing a word or a phrase or two, but being able to speak it well even though the person hadn't studied the language. Similarly, they include knowing a foreign language when someone else speaks it to the person. Second, they include the faculty for divulging future or hidden events, or in modern terms, precognition and clairvoyance. And third, they include powers which are beyond the subject's age and natural condition, like having way too much strength, abnormal strength, being one of the examples given by Peter Thyracus. 
or be able to walk up walls or levitate, which in modern terms would be psychokinesis. However, the text indicates that such displays, when taken together as a whole, build up the evidence for possession. Just one of these isn't good evidence for possession, and even taken together as a whole, they only build up evidence for possession. They don't prove it. After all, speaking a foreign language or speaking in tongues is also a gift of the Holy Ghost. Telling the future or hidden things is the gift of prophecy, and Samson displayed abnormal strength. So the same abilities can be produced by divine power rather than by demons. And doctors of the church, like St. Augustine, Pope St. Gregory the Great, and St. Thomas Aquinas, held that such abilities also could be due to natural human abilities, which today we would call psychic abilities. For example, as we covered in episodes 105 and 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the Occult, Aquinas referred to precognition as natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. And he also believed in a form of psychokinesis, or mind over matter, as a purely natural human ability. So just because a person has unusual abilities, that doesn't mean he's demonically possessed. That's why the display of such abilities just builds evidence rather than proving possession. The criteria thus need to be supplemented for proof, and they have been supplemented. To anticipate some of the material that we'll get into later and in future episodes, we can summarize the criteria for possession more fully under three headings. First, there needs to be an alternative personality manifesting, that is, the demon itself. Second, this personality needs to be able to do preternatural things, that is, things that show that something more than just an illness, like multiple personality or dissociative identity disorder, is involved. And third, the personality needs to be markedly averse to the holy, like not being able to say the name of Jesus or not being able to look at a picture of the Virgin Mary. That suggests that the preternatural abilities aren't being produced by divine power or by paranormal human abilities. It's those three criteria, alternate personality, preternatural abilities, and aversion to the holy, that are the most decisive markers of demonic possession. Now, back to the 1614 rules. 4. In order to understand these matters better, let him inquire of the person possessed, following one or the other act of exorcism, what the latter experienced in his body or soul while the exorcism was being performed, and to learn also what particular words in the form had a more intimidating effect upon the devil, so that hereafter these words may be employed with greater stress and frequency. So this indicates that the exorcist may need to perform more than one exorcism on the person, which is what experience shows. And it says the exorcist should ask the possessed person what he felt while the exorcism was happening and which words in the ceremony had the most intimidating effect on the demon so that he can use these words with greater stress and frequency next time. And this points to something that I think is very important, and it has to do with the theory of how exorcism works. It's important to note that the church does not have an official teaching on how people get possessed or how specifically exorcism gets the demon out. And exorcists are not agreed on this matter. I read exorcists' books, and they have a variety of different theories, both about what results in demons possessing people and about how exorcism causes the demons to leave. So you may have heard one or more theories on this, but know that none of them are definitive, and exorcists themselves disagree about which theories are accurate. Now, if you listen to some people, they present a legal theory of exorcism, where the person somehow did things that gave the demon a legal right to enter him, and then the exorcist basically hangs up an eviction notice to get him out. However, I'm quite skeptical of this theory. In the first place, it places the blame for the possession on the victim, and we have many instances of possession where the person didn't do anything to give a legal right to a demon to get possessed. Second, 
demons aren't great at abiding by laws. I mean, if they were law abiders, they wouldn't have broken God's laws and become demons in the first place. Further, if they were law abiders, they would all exit as soon as the eviction notice is hung up by the exorcist and they realize they don't have a legal right to be here anymore. But what we see in this passage of the 1614 rite is that the demon is trying to stay in the person despite the eviction notice. It experiences pain and intimidation in certain parts of the ceremony, which the exorcist is asked to use more frequently in the future. That tells me that the legal theory is inadequate. I mean, it could be part of what's happening, but it's not all of what's happening. Instead, the exorcism inflicts pain, including intimidation or fear on the demon, and that is at least part of what gets it to leave. We'll have more to say about this when we talk about the theories of exorcism in the future. We now turn to a set of rules designed to warn the exorcist of the fact that the demons will try to deceive both him and the victim into thinking that the person either is or is not possessed, or that he has been freed when really the demons are still inside him. 5. He will be on his guard against the arts and the subterfuges which the evil spirits are wont to use in deceiving the exorcist. For oft times they give deceptive answers and make it difficult to understand them so that the exorcist might tire and give up, or so it might appear that the afflicted one is in no wise possessed by the devil. 6. Once in a while, after they are already recognized, they conceal themselves and leave the body practically free from every molestation, so that the victim believes himself completely delivered. Yet the exorcist may not desist until he sees the signs of deliverance. 7. At times, moreover, the evil spirits place whatever obstacles they can in the way, so that the patient may not submit to exorcism, or they try to convince him that his affliction is a natural one. Meanwhile, during the exorcism, they cause him to fall asleep and dangle some illusion before him, while they seclude themselves so that the afflicted one appears to be freed. Here we have a set of references to how deceptive demons can be, which is something we'll hear more about as we go along. The text says that the exorcist should not give up until he sees the signs of deliverance. Unfortunately, a, as commentators on this passage have noted, the text doesn't tell us what such signs would be, so that's up for the individual exorcist to form opinions about. 8. Some reveal a crime which has been committed, and the perpetrators thereof, as well as the means of putting an end to it. Yet the afflicted person must beware of having recourse on this account to sorcerers or necromancers, or to any parties except the ministers of the church, or of making use of any superstitious or forbidden practice. This is a really interesting warning. It says that sometimes the demons may reveal a crime and who committed it. And the apparent purpose of their doing so is to get the possessed person to go to a sorcerer or necromancer to get revenge on the criminals by having a curse put on them. But the warning says that the energumen is not to do that. They shouldn't make use of anyone except the ministers of the church, and they shouldn't use any superstitious or forbidden practice to deal with the situation. 9. Sometimes the devil will leave the possessed person in peace and even allow him to receive the Holy Eucharist to make it appear that he has departed. In fact, the arts and frauds of the evil one for deceiving a man are innumerable. For this reason, the exorcist must be on his guard not to fall into this trap. The text also indicates that, yes, a possessed person can be normal in church and receive the Eucharist, so that's not a certain sign that he's been freed from the demon. And once again, we have a warning about how deceptive demons are. The text says that their arts at deception are innumerable. 10. Therefore, he will be mindful of the words of our Lord, to the effect that there is a certain type of evil spirit who cannot be driven out except by prayer and fasting. Therefore, let him avail himself of these two means above all for imploring the divine assistance in expelling demons, after the example of the Holy Fathers. And not only himself, 
but let him induce others, as far as possible, to do the same. Here, the text gives an instruction that comes from the Gospels to make exorcism more effective. Jesus said that certain types of demons only come out by prayer and fasting, so the exorcist and the others involved in the case should all pray and fast, and that will help get the demon out. Notice that what the prayer and fasting have in common is that they are both holy actions. You Prayer is holy, fasting is holy. In Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lists both of these actions as acts of righteousness. So keep that in mind as we go forward. These acts of righteousness or holy actions help get the demons out. 11. If it can be done conveniently, the possessed person should be led to church or to some other sacred and worthy place where the exorcism will be held, away from the crowd. But if the person is ill, or for any valid reason, the exorcism may take place in a private home. So you can perform an exorcism at a private home, like if the possessed person is sick, but it's preferable to perform it in a church or some other sacred place. So again, there's a preference for doing the exorcism in a setting that has special holiness, like a church or a shrine. So there's more holiness, remember that. You just don't want to have a big crowd there, although, as we'll see in future episodes, that rule didn't always get followed. In some historical cases, there were big crowds present at exorcisms. 12. The subject, if in good mental and physical health, should be exhorted to implore God's help, to fast, and to fortify himself by frequent reception of penance and holy communion at the discretion of the priest and in the course of the exorcism, he should be fully recollected, with his intention fixed on God, whom he should entreat with firm faith and in all humility. And if he is all the more grievously tormented, he ought to bear this patiently, never doubting the divine assistance. So the intergumen himself needs to implore God's help, that is, to pray and to fast, and to receive the sacraments of penance and holy communion frequently, piling on more holiness. He should pray during the exorcism, and if that increases his suffering, he should bear it patiently, entrusting himself to God's assistance. So, the energumen should do something holy, even if it makes the demon more uncomfortable and causes him to suffer a little more. 13. The exorcist ought to have a crucifix at hand, or somewhere in sight. If relics of the saints are available, they are to be applied in a reverent way to the breast or the head of the person possessed. The relics must be properly and securely encased and covered. One will see to it that these sacred objects are not treated improperly or that no injury is done them by the evil spirit. However, one should not hold the Holy Eucharist over the head of the person or in any way apply it to his body owing to the danger of desecration. So once more, we're piling on the holiness by the exorcist having a crucifix in hand or at least within sight of the intergumen. And the relics of properly protected saints are to be reverently applied to his head or chest, but don't use the Eucharist for this purpose because the danger of the evil spirit desecrating it is too high. Still, the theme is piling on more holiness. 14. The exorcist must not digress into senseless prattle, nor ask superfluous questions, or such as are prompted by curiosity, particularly if they pertain to future and hidden matters, all of which have nothing to do with his office. Instead, he will bid the unclean spirit keep silence and answer only when asked. Neither ought he to give any credence to the devil if the latter maintains that he is the spirit of some saint or of a deceased party or even claims to be a good angel. Now, to my mind, this contains one of the most important instructions for the exorcist. Do not start talking with demons about stuff. 
Do not try to get them to reveal future or hidden matters. As we'll hear in future episodes, this was a big problem with exorcisms in the Middle Ages, and it's even a big problem with some modern-day pop culture exorcists. But the 1614 rite specifically warns against talking with demons. It says to tell them to shut up and only answer when asked. The reason for this being obvious, as Jesus says in John 8, 44, Satan is the father of lies. And so demons are working for the father of lies. You can't trust anything they say, so don't even bother talking with them. The passage also says not to give any credence or belief if the demon says it's the spirit of a good angel, a saint, or another deceased person. This passage doesn't settle the question of whether a damned soul could possess a person. You know, like I said, there's a difference of opinion on that among exorcists today. But if you've identified the fact that the person is possessed, just get the spirit out and don't accept what it says when it claims to be an angel, a saint, or perhaps a soul from purgatory. The 1614 right then gives examples of things that it considers to be useful questions to ask the spirits. 15. But necessary questions are, for example, the number and name of the spirits inhabiting the patient, the time when they entered into him, the cause thereof, and the like. So the text says that questions you can or should ask the intergumen include the number of spirits in him, the names of the spirits in him, when they entered, and what caused them to enter him. It also alludes to similar questions being okay, but it doesn't give any examples. One that example that has been used by some exorcists is asking when the spirit will leave the possessed person. However, there is reason to question even these inquiries. As we'll see, this passage has been omitted from the 1998 rite, which doesn't envision the exorcist asking the possessed person any questions at all, and I think with good reason. When it comes to the number of demons, the 1614 rite itself has noted that they will try to use deception. For example, they may try to convince the intergumen and the exorcist that there are no demons in him left at all, or you know they've all gone, both of which amount to deception about the number of demons. And the experience of exorcists suggests that, indeed, they may say there are a certain number of demons in the person, and yet it turns out there are really more. So you can't trust their answer on the number question. Further, the name of the demon or demons is not necessary. The reason people tend to ask that question is that in one single exorcism in the New Testament, Jesus asked a demon its name. But even then, the demoniac doesn't give him a straight answer. It says that they are legion, that there are many demons involved. So we got a whole bunch of names. But Jesus gets the legion of demons out anyway without knowing their individual names. And he never asks the demons' names at all in his other exorcisms. So you clearly don't need the demon's name to get it out. And finally, demons just flat out lie about all this stuff as experience shows. In his book, An Exorcist Explains the Demonic, Father Gabriel Amorth writes, During the rite, I ask the unclean spirit his name. Each one has a name. Naturally, the prince of lies always tries not to respond or is vague if he does not lie outright. The same can be said when I ask when and how he entered that particular body and when he will leave. But here also it is necessary to be very prudent, Rarely does the date given correspond to the real date. So even a famous exorcist like Gabriel Amorth admits that demons can and do lie about their names and when they entered the person and when they will leave the person. And if they lie about those things, then frankly, they'll also lie about how they got into the person. Before we go on, let me ask a question. Some pop culture exorcists claim that you can compel a demon to tell the truth in Jesus' name. Is that true? Could you compel them to tell the truth in these cases? Well, this idea is promoted by some pop culture exorcists, particularly ones who want to justify asking demons questions that they shouldn't be asking. But this is not supported by church teaching or practice. Neither 
the 1614 right nor the 1998 right has any prayer in it for compelling the demons to tell the truth. And if there was a way to get them to tell the truth, exorcists like Father Amorth would be using it. And they wouldn't have to worry about the demons lying to them in the matters he named. But he does say that they frequently lie about these matters. So you can't count on just saying some prayer to get them to tell the truth. Like, I adjure you by Jesus Christ, tell me the truth on this. You know, that's not going to work. It's just a myth that is unsupported by the rites of exorcism and by actual experience. Now, let's continue with what this particular rule has to say. As for all jesting, laughing, and nonsense on the part of the evil spirit, the exorcist should prevent it or condemn it, and he will exhort the bystanders, whose number must be very limited, to pay no attention to such goings-on. Neither are they to put any question to the subject. Rather, they should intercede for him to God in all humility and urgency. So, once again, a warning to just ignore other stuff that the demon is saying and doing. Uh, The limited number of people who are present also should pay no attention to such things, and under no circumstances should they ask any questions of the possessed person. Instead, they should simply pray for him. 16. Let the priest pronounce the exorcism in a commanding and authoritative voice, and at the same time, with great confidence, humility, and fervor. And when he sees that the spirit is sorely vexed, then he oppresses and threatens all the more. So this again goes to our theory of exorcism. It envisions the exorcist causing the demon pain and fear, and when he sees that it's working, he oppresses and threatens the demon all the more. This suggests that what actually causes the demon to leave is not hanging up a legal notice but causing the demon pain and fear. But what is it about the exorcism that does that? We've already noticed the ritual recommend in piling on holiness, like prayer, fasting, the sacraments, the cross, and relics. Well, this section returns to that theme. If he notices that the person afflicted is experiencing a disturbance in some part of his body, or an acute pain or a swelling appears in some part, he traces the sign of the cross over that place and sprinkles it with holy water, which he must have at hand for this purpose. So the sign of the cross and holy water are also sacred things, and he's to apply them to whatever part of the body is being disturbed or has an acute pain or swelling. 17. He will pay attention as to what words in particular cause the evil spirits to tremble, repeating them the more frequently. And when he comes to a threatening expression, he recurs to it again and again, always increasing the punishment. If he perceives that he is making progress, let him persist for two, three, four hours, and longer if he can, until victory is attained. So this again goes to our theory of exorcism. The exorcist is to repeat words that cause the spirits to tremble with fear. He's to repeat threatening expressions, such as what God's going to do to the demon in the future, which will only increase if it keeps oppressing the person. And thus, the exorcist is to always be increasing the punishment he's inflicting on the demon. So again, we're punishing the demon to get it to leave by inflicting anguish and fear and suffering on it by exposing it to holiness in the name of the church and the knowledge of what God will do to it in the future. That's the key part of making exorcisms work. The next instruction changes the topic, but is also interesting. 18. The exorcist should guard against giving or recommending any medicine to the patient, but should leave this care to physicians. This one is likely there because under old canon law, they didn't want priests practicing medicine. I gather that the reason for this was they didn't want people blaming the church if their loved one didn't get better, or worse yet, was harmed by medical malpractice. So they didn't want priests working in this area. They wanted non-clerical physicians giving medical care to people, including the possessed. And this was no doubt in part because of how hit and miss medicine was back in the past, while it's much better, though still not perfect today. 
canon law on this point is different now, and priests can be medical doctors, and recommending an over-the-counter treatment like aspirin or something for an upset stomach certainly wouldn't be a problem today, but this is what the law said at the time. 19. While performing the exorcism over a woman, he ought always to have assisting him several women of good repute, who will hold on to the person when she is harassed by the evil spirit. These assistants ought, if possible, to be close relatives of the subject, and for the sake of decency, the exorcist will avoid saying or doing anything which might prove an occasion of evil thoughts to himself or to the others. This rule is present for reasons of modesty. The priest was not to grab a female energumen. Instead, women would hold her if she's thrashing around and preferably her close relatives if possible. Also, the priest is warned not to say or do anything that would cause sexual temptation for himself or others. During the exorcism, he shall preferably employ words from Holy Writ, rather than forms of his own or of someone else. So, during the exorcism, they want you to prefer words that come from Scripture, not things you or other people have composed. He shall, moreover, command the devil to tell whether he is detained in that body by necromancy, by evil signs or amulets. And if the one possessed has taken the latter by mouth, he should be made to vomit them. If he has concealed them on his person, he should expose them. And when discovered, they must be burned. Moreover, the person should be exhorted to reveal all his temptations to the exorcist. This is where the practice of asking how the demon got into the person comes from. And you can ask such a question, but you shouldn't simply trust what the demon says. Since, as Father Amworth noted, they can and will lie about their names, when they got in, and when they're going to leave, they can lie about this too. The 1614 text envisions the demon possibly having gotten in by necromancy, that is, black magic that summons evil spirits, It also envisions the possibility of possession due to evil signs being made on objects or using evil amulets. And if it turns out that the latter are involved, then getting rid of them and burning them would certainly be a good idea. I should note that the 1998 rite does not envision these possibilities. In fact, it goes in the other direction. And people today, including the church, have much less confidence in the efficacy of black magic, but this was much more accepted back in 1614. The practice of the intergumen revealing all his temptations to the exorcist also is not present in the current rite. 21. Finally, after the possessed one has been freed, let him be admonished to guard himself carefully against falling into sin so as to afford no opportunity to the evil spirit of returning, lest the last state of that man become worse than the former. This is based on Jesus' parable in Matthew 12 and Luke 11, where he says that when an unclean spirit leaves a man, it may return, and comparing the man to a house, the unclean spirit finds the house clean and swept and put in order, but it brings with it seven even more evil spirits, so the final state of the man is worse than it was before. Here, the avoiding of sin is viewed as a form of protection against being possessed again, which would be consistent with the theory we've been noting of holiness being repulsive to demons. Since if the man is not in sin, then he's in a state of holiness, and that holiness will have the tendency to repel the demons. That completes the rules at the beginning of the 1614 rite. What else should we know about it? We're not going to go through the rest of the rite word by word because that would take a lot of time, but we will look at some key passages and its basic structure. The first passage actually deals with what's done before the rite and how it begins. 1. The priest delegated by the ordinary to perform this office should first go to confession, or at least elicit an act of contrition, and, if convenient, offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and implore God's help in other fervent prayers. He vests in surplice and purple stole. Having before him the person possessed, who should be bound if there is any danger, he traces the sign of the cross over him, over himself and the bystanders, and then sprinkles all of them with holy water. After this, he kneels and says the litany of the saints, 
exclusive of the prayers which follow it. The first prayer said in the rite of exorcism is thus the litany of the saints. After that, there's a bit of dialogue between the priest and those who are assisting him at the exorcism. And then they pray Psalm 53, which is Psalm 54 in most Bibles. It begins with the invocation, O God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. After a bit more dialogue, the priest invokes God, saying, God, whose nature is ever merciful and forgiving, accept our prayer that this servant of yours, bound by the fetters of sin, may be pardoned by your loving kindness. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who once and for all consigned that fallen and apostate tyrant to the flames of hell, who sent your only begotten Son into the world to crush that roaring lion. Hasten to our call for help, and snatch from ruination and from the clutches of the noonday devil this human being made in your image and likeness. Strike terror, Lord, into the beast now laying waste your vineyard. Fill your servants with courage to fight manfully against that reprobate dragon, lest he despise those who put their trust in you, and say with Pharaoh of old, I know not God, nor will I set Israel free. Let your mighty hand cast him out of your servant, name, so he may no longer hold captive this person whom it pleased you to make in your image and to redeem through your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. So God is being asked to cast out the devil, and the part of this that deals with what effects the devil is expected to experience refers to God striking terror in the demon, so that's making it hard for him to stay through inducing fear. Then, for the first time in the rite, the exorcist addresses the demon itself. I command you, unclean spirit, whoever you are, along with all your minions now attacking this servant of God, by the mysteries of the Incarnation, Passion, Resurrection, and Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the descent of the Holy Spirit, by the coming of our Lord for judgment, that you tell me by some sign your name and the day and hour of your departure. I command you, moreover, to obey me to the letter. I, who am a minister of God, despite my unworthiness, nor shall you be emboldened to harm in any way this creature of God, or the bystanders, or any of their possessions. So here the exorcist asks the names of the demon and when it will depart. He also commands it to obey him, but that's not a guarantee that it will obey him. As Father Amworth noted, demons often lie about these things. They may also seek to do harm to the possessed person or the bystanders, so the demon is not guaranteed to obey. After that, the exorcist reads one or more of, of select passages from the Gospels, and there's a prayer to God. The exorcist makes the sign of the cross over himself and over the energumen. He puts the end of his stole over the energumen's neck, and he puts his right hand on his head and says, See the cross of the Lord. Be gone, you hostile powers. There are then several exorcisms that can be said. As a sample, the first one is, I cast you out, unclean spirit, along with every satanic power of the enemy, every specter from hell, and all your fell companions. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, be gone and stay far from this creature of God. For it is he who commands you, he who flung you headlong from the heights of heaven into the depths of hell. It is he who commands you, he who once stilled the sea and the wind and the storm. Hearken, therefore, and tremble in fear, Satan, you enemy of the faith, you foe of the human race, you begetter of death, you robber of life, you corrupter of justice, you root of all evil and vice, seducer of men, betrayer of the nations, instigator of envy, font of avarice, fomenter of discord, author of pain and sorrow. Why then do you stand and resist, knowing as you must that Christ the Lord brings your plans to nothing? Fear him, who in Isaac was offered in sacrifice, in Joseph sold into bondage, slain as the Paschal Lamb, crucified as man, yet triumphed over the powers of hell. 
The three signs of the cross which follow are traced on the brow of the possessed person. Be gone, then, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Give place to the Holy Spirit by this sign of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. They may also say the Athanasian Creed and some of the Psalms, and after the demon is cast out, the exorcist says a prayer for further protection. Almighty God, we beg you to keep the evil spirit from further molesting the servant of yours, and to keep him far away, never to return. At your command, O Lord, may the goodness and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, take possession of this man. May we no longer fear any evil, since the Lord is with us, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. The rite also has an appendix, which is the exorcism of Satan and the fallen angels, the one that Pope Leo XIII wrote. And the rubric says that it's meant for general use to combat the power of evil spirits over a community or locality not specifically over an individual possessed person. But those are the basics of the 1614 rite of exorcism. Now, before we get to the 1998 rite, I do want to stop and take a moment here to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including John M., Michelle S., Ben, Sam M., and Kyle C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and buy the debut novel Pilgrims by M.R. Leonard, Alien Invasion, The Catholic Church, and a failed Latin teacher. Pilgrims is inspired by Augustine's confessions and tells the story of a washed up Latin teacher who gets thrust into the center of humanity's first contact with extraterrestrials who land at the Vatican and claim to be Catholic. Mysterious World fans who enjoy compelling science fiction from a Catholic point of view can find pilgrims wherever books are sold and at mrleonardauthor.com. And for those who enjoy audiobooks, Pilgrims is also available as a full multicast production. This StarQuest show is also brought to you by Exodus 90 and the Exodus 90 app. Men, we are called to share the hope and joy of Jesus Christ. Our family, friends, and community desperately need us to imitate our Lord to be radically present and available. What if you intentionally live this Advent season differently, focused not on buying Christmas presents, but sharing the loving presence of Jesus Christ? We want to invite you to join us on the Exodus 90 app and break out of the religion of the world. Join the men of Exodus 90 and Monsignor James Shea, President of the University of Mary, who's our spiritual guide for Advent this year on the Exodus 90 app. Together, we will rediscover the hope that God lays out for us in the coming of His Son into the world. Go to exodus90.com slash sqpn to learn more about Advent on the Exodus 90 app. That's exodus90.com slash sqpn. To join men from around the world this Advent, starting December 1st, be radically free in Jesus Christ this Advent. So, Jimmy, how are we going to go through the 1998 Rite of Exorcism? Well, we won't be going through it in as much detail as we did the 1614 Rite. We've already laid a basic foundation by looking at the previous Rite. But we will be looking at select passages in it and noting the similarities and differences. Some pop culture exorcists have been very critical of the 1998 right. What do you think of that attitude? Just like I'd resist any attempt to completely reject the current right of the sacraments, like saying the old right of mass is the only valid one and the new right of mass is completely invalid, I'd reject anyone doing the same with the two rites of exorcism. Both rites are perfectly effective and will drive out demons. 
If you want to say that the 1614 right was better on one point or another, I'm fine with that. In fact, I would say that both rights have strengths and weaknesses. My view would be to say that the 1614 right does some things better and the 1998 right does some things better. However, in the last almost 400 years, the Holy Spirit has continued guiding the church, and we've been gaining more experience with demons and with science, so there should be, in principle, a refinement on certain points today. The general trajectory should be one of improvement, even though the substance of the two rites is the same. What do you make of the claim that the new version of the rite has been systematically weakened? To address this, we need to look at an example of the charge. Here's a summary by journalist and author John Thavis. The new rite featured a petitionary invocation written by Vatican liturgists. In essence, Vatican officials were suggesting that the modern exorcist's efforts should be directed toward praying to God, not issuing commands to Satan. That immediately provoked the scorn of experienced exorcists who believed cases of possession required direct engagement with the devil, not merely pious prayers. This watered-down version of the ritual that had worked well for hundreds of years lacked the force of the old rite and was far too passive in tone, introducing an option in which the exorcist asks the devil to depart, rather than commanding him to do so. Now, having read the rite itself, I have to say I'm rather gobsmacked, because this is a flatly inaccurate presentation of the new rite, as we'll see. I can think of two explanations for why Thavis would summarize the new rite this way, And the first is that he simply has not read the new rite, and he's relying on what he's been told about the rite. If so, I can understand that up to a point, because the new rite, at least in English, is not in general distribution, at least here in the U.S. It's only distributed to bishops, who can then give it to those who need it. But as a journalist writing on the subject, Thavis should have gotten a copy of it and read it before commenting on it. So if he didn't read it, I can only understand that up to a point. What's the second explanation you can think of for Thavis's summary? That he's referring to an earlier version of the rite. As Adam Bly explains, after the 1998 rite was initially released, the rite underwent a number of revisions. Some of the text, as well as the addition of an appendix that contains many of the more imprecatory passages and combative language that was not used in this rite, but played a prominent role in the 1614 rite, was modified. The number of revisions is not published, but the commonly discussed number in the exorcist community is five. So the 1998 rite underwent a number of revisions, and these strengthened the language and added back some of the more confrontational materials. So perhaps Thavis is only speaking of the original edition of the rite, and he's not taking into account the current version, which is what I'm using. And as we'll see, it very much does involve the exorcist ordering the devil to get out of the person. So the summary that Thavis gave and any parallel criticisms of the right are just mistaken. Can exorcists still use the 1614 right? Yes. In 1998, John Paul II gave permission for the Congregation of Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments to give dispensations to priests to use the 1614 right, and that was further broadened during the reign of Pope Benedict XVI with his liberalization of the use of the older form of liturgy. When it comes to the Mass, Pope Benedict's reforms were modified and partially restricted by Pope Francis, but when it comes to exorcism, Adam Bly explains, Since the previous permissions and instructions about the solemn exorcism were not related to the Latin Mass, they remain in force. The use of the 1614 rite of exorcism is still allowed without special permission. In practice, Most bishops allow their exorcists to use whichever rite they are more comfortable with or prefer to use. That being said, there have been questions that were debated in the past, and a future dubia, that is, an official question to Rome, may yield a different interpretation of the law. So that's the state of the law today. Then with that as background, let's look at the 1998 rite of exorcism. What should we know? Well, its preface, or prenotanda, is considerably longer than the rules at the beginning of the 1614 rite. In fact, the whole document 
whose uh, title is Exorcisms and Certain Supplications, is much longer. It runs 54 pages in length. And that's not too surprising because modern church documents tend to be quite a bit longer than they used to be. When it comes to the structure of the documents, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops explains, The ritual text, Exorcisms and Related Supplications, is comprised of an introduction, two chapters, the rite of major exorcism and various texts, and concludes with two appendices. The second chapter provides a series of additional texts, which serve as options in the administration of the rite itself. The first appendix contains exorcistic prayers, to be used at the discretion of the diocesan bishop when a thing or place has become demonically penetrated, or the church herself faces persecution and opposition. This latter series of prayers is not to be confused with the rite of major exorcism itself. Finally, the second appendix provides prayers and supplications for the private use of the faithful. As we did with the 1614 rite, we're going to principally be focusing on the introduction. It has six sections. The first surveys church teaching on demons and the biblical history of exorcisms, such as in the ministry of Jesus. The second section deals with exorcisms in the life of the church today and introduces the concept of minor and major exorcisms. The third section is titled The Minister and Conditions for Performing a Major Exorcism, and it's here that we encounter the material that most concerns us. The document stresses that only a priest can can be appointed as an exorcist, and it says that he needs to have basically the same qualifications mentioned in the 1614 rite. It also notes that he can be appointed either stably or for a particular occasion. That is, the bishop can appoint him to just perform a single exorcism on a person or an exor- exorcisms on a single person, or he can give him an assignment as an exorcist in a more stable way, so he does it on an ongoing basis. Then the rite gives cautions to the priest that he needs to bear in mind before performing a major exorcism. 14. In the case of some intervention that is said to be demonic, the exorcist should above all use the utmost circumspection and prudence as a matter of necessity. First of all, he should not too easily believe that someone is possessed by a demon, when the person may be laboring under some illness, especially of a psychological nature. Likewise, he absolutely should not believe that possession is present when, for the first time, Someone claims to be tempted in a special way by the devil, to be desolate, and finally to be tormented, for one can be deceived by one's own imagination. Let him also take note, lest he be mistaken, of the arts and deceits that the devil uses to trick someone into believing that his or her infirmity is natural or has a medical cause, to persuade the possessed person not to undergo exorcism. In every way, he should examine precisely whether a person who is said to be tormented by a demon truly is so tormented. So the exorcist is to be cautious but open-minded when someone claims to be possessed. He needs to look at the possibility of an illness, especially a psychological one, and he needs to look for the possibility that the person's imagination is deceiving him. On the other hand, he needs to be wary of the fact that the demons could be trying to trick the person into thinking he's not possessed so that he won't get an exorcism. And this is all basically a reworking of the same material we read in the 1614 rite. 15. He should accurately distinguish cases of the devil's assault from that credulity with which some people, even the faithful, think that they are the object of evil doing, of bad luck, or of a curse brought by others upon them, or upon their relatives, or upon their goods. When the text refers to evil doing, that's a reference to black magic. And the text says that the exorcist should accurately distinguish between cases of demonic attack and cases where a person credulously believes that he's the victim of black magic, bad luck, or a curse that someone has put on him. Does that mean that the church is taking the position that black magic, bad luck, and curses aren't real? That's certainly one way of taking the text, and it's a plausible reading, which will make some pop culture exorcists mad, who can be very big on spells and curses as being causes of possession. 
There may be a way to reconcile this passage with their view, but at a minimum, the church is urging considerable skepticism on this point. And at a minimum, we should not quickly accept the idea that black magic, bad luck, or curses are causes of possession. As to what the exorcist is to do when he's confronted with such a situation, the rite continues. He should not deny them spiritual help, but in no way is he to make use of exorcism. He can, however, offer some appropriate prayers with them and for them, so that they may find God's peace. Likewise, spiritual help is not to be refused to believers whom the evil one does not touch, but are distressed by his temptation, while wishing to preserve their fidelity to the Lord Jesus and to the gospel. This may also be done by a priest who is not an exorcist, and even by a deacon using appropriate prayers and supplications. So, in cases where a major exorcism isn't warranted, you still want to pray with the troubled person and provide them with proper pastoral care. And you don't have to be an exorcist to do that. An ordinary priest or deacon can do that as well. 16. An exorcist, therefore, should not proceed to celebrate an exorcism unless he has ascertained, with moral certitude, that the one to be exorcised is really possessed by a demon, and, if it is possible, celebrate it with the consent of that person. So the exorcist needs moral certitude that the possession is real. Personally, I don't know that I'd insist on that provision. I can imagine situations in which it would be beneficial to perform an exorcism without moral certainty of possession, uh, not in any and all circumstances, but in some special circumstances, I can imagine doing a kind of precautionary exorcism. But I don't write the rules, and that's what the current instructions say. What I find interesting is that it only says to do the exorcism if it is possible with the consent of the possessed person, which means that there are circumstances where you can perform an exorcism without the person's permission. Now we get to the diagnostic criteria for possession. According to established practice, the following are considered as signs of being possessed by demons. Speaking a number of words in an unknown language, or understanding someone speaking. Making known distant and hidden events. Showing strength beyond the nature of the individual's age or condition. These are the same examples of preternatural abilities mentioned in the 1614 rite that are based on those proposed by the Jesuit author Peter Thyracus, among others. However, as we discussed previously, the mere presence of these does not prove possession, and the rite notes this. Such signs can offer some indication. Since, however, signs of this kind are not necessarily to be reckoned as coming from the devil, it is also necessary to pay attention to other things, especially those of the moral and spiritual order, which in another way manifest diabolical intervention, as, for example, vehement aversion from God, the most holy name of Jesus, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints, the Church, the Word of God, sacred things and rites, especially sacramental ones, and from sacred images. So this is the third criterion I mentioned earlier, aversion to the holy. Preternatural abilities prove that something preternatural is happening, but they don't prove that demons are responsible. However, demons are notably averse to the holy, so if that's also present, it gives you a much stronger indication. The text also notes, And finally, Sometimes the relation of all the signs to faith and to spiritual combat in the Christian life must be carefully weighed, since the evil one first of all is the enemy of God, and of everything that unites the faithful together with the salvific action of God. The right then states, 17. Regarding the necessity of using the rite of exorcism, the exorcist will make a prudent judgment after diligent inquiry always preserving the seal of confession, having consulted, to the extent possible, experts in spiritual matters, and, if necessary, in the science of medicine and psychiatry, who have a sense of spiritual realities. The exorcist thus should consult, to the extent possible, experts in spiritual matters before deciding the case. If necessary, he also should consult experts in medicine or psychiatry, 
However, you don't want to just consult any doctor or psychiatrist because some of them will dismiss the possibility of demonic possession out of hand. So the text says that these experts need to have a sense of spiritual matters. It's also noteworthy that the text says the exorcist must always preserve the seal of confession. So if the troubled person sacramentally confesses something to the priest, he cannot tell that to anyone else. Even if it's relevant to do in the exorcism, he cannot tell an outside expert uh, he consults. He cannot tell any assistance he employs in the exorcism itself. And he can't tell anyone else at all. The seal of confession must be preserved at all times. Does that mean he can't act on what was confessed to him? Well, not the way I read the law. Canon 983 deals with the seal of confession itself, and it deals with revealing both the sin and the sinner. But the relevant canon here is Canon 984, Section 1. It deals with any information that the priest learns in confession, not just the sins. And it says... A confessor is prohibited completely from using knowledge acquired from confession to the detriment of the penitent, even when any danger of revelation is excluded. So the exorcist could not use the information learned from the person in confession to that person's detriment, even if he has a way of excluding any danger of revealing the information to others. But it doesn't say that he can't use the information to the person's benefit. So, providing he can avoid revealing the information to others, he can at least use the information to help the person, such as by deciding that the exorcism needs to be done or or deciding that one does not need to be done. He can use the information to help the person, but outside of confession, he can't allow others to know why he made the decision he did, that it was because of a confession. 18. In cases affecting a non-Catholic, and in other more difficult cases, the matter should be brought to the attention of the diocesan bishop, who, out of prudence, may seek the advice of some experts before a decision about an exorcism may be reached. This formally acknowledges that Catholic exorcists can perform exorcisms for non-Catholics, which actually happens more than you might suppose, since some Christian traditions don't have exorcisms, so their own ministers may not be able to do it, in which case they may consult a Catholic priest even though they're not Catholic. But in such cases, you need to check with the diocesan bishop. 19. The exorcism should be performed in such a way that it manifests the faith of the church, and that no one can consider it as a magical or superstitious activity. So the exorcist should not present the rite as if it had magical effects on its own apart from the power of God. He also needs to avoid sensationalism and respect the possessed person's privacy. Care must be taken that the exorcism not become a spectacle for those present. In no way may any opportunity be given to any of the media of social communication while the exorcism is taking place, or even before the exorcism takes place. And when it has been performed, the exorcist and those present, observing due discretion, should not divulge information about it. So, no filming or recording of the exorcism for public release. Nothing that goes into TV, radio, the movies, the internet, the newspapers, etc., Nothing that goes into the media, either before or during the exorcism. And afterwards, neither the exorcist nor his assistant should divulge information about it. What about all the accounts of exorcism we hear about in the media today, where priests describe cases of exorcism that they've done? Do these violate this? Not necessarily. If you keep the person anonymous by removing their name and any identifying details, then you could give a basic account of what happened. Or if you change the person's name and change any identifying details, you could do the same thing. You just need to, in that case, alert your reader that you've done that. And finally, uh, the restriction only binds the exorcist and the assistants who are present. So if the possessed person themselves starts talking with the media, that could create additional liberty on the part of the exorcist. For example, being able to confirm 
the person's account of what happened, although I can also see some exorcists refusing to comment on such situations. We now come to the fourth section of the introduction. What does it deal with? It provides an overview of the rite itself, and it's a helpful summary of how the rite works, so we'll go ahead and quote from it. It says, 21. The rite begins with a sprinkling of holy water, by which, as a memorial of the purification received in baptism, the troubled person is defended against the snares of the enemy. The water may be blessed before the rite, or within the rite itself before the sprinkling, and, if appropriate, with the commingling of salt. 22. Then follows the prayer of the litany, by which the mercy of God is invoked upon the troubled person through the intercession of all the saints. So, just like in the 1614 rite, the litany of the saints is used at the beginning, we then turn to the scripture readings. 23. After the litany, the exorcist may recite one or several of the psalms that implore the protection of the Most High and extol the victory of Christ over the evil one. The psalms are said either as a single unit or in responsorial manner. When the psalm is completed, the exorcist himself may add a psalm prayer. 24. Then the gospel is proclaimed as a sign of the presence of Christ, who through his own word and the proclamation of the church brings healing to human infirmities. That's also like the 1614 rite, where they pray Psalm 53 and also had, a, had gospel readings. 25. Afterward, the exorcist imposes hands upon the troubled person, by which rite the power of the Holy Spirit is invoked, so that the devil will depart from the one who through baptism was made the temple of God. At the same time, he may also breathe upon the face of the troubled person. This is similar to the point in the 1614 rite where the exorcist put his hand on the possessed person's head. It also adds the option of him breathing on the person, similar to how Jesus breathed on the twelve to give them the Holy Spirit in John 20. So that would be piling on more holiness, compelling the demon to get out. 26. Then the Apostles' Creed is recited, or the baptismal promise of faith is renewed with the renunciation of Satan. The Lord's Prayer follows, by which our God and Father is implored to set us free from the evil one. Here, the Apostles' Creed replaces the Athanasian Creed from the 1614 rite. The Apostles' Creed is the much older of the two, and it is much more familiar to people today, making it easier to say. And the addition of the Lord's Prayer, which was only a recommended option in the 1614 rite, strikes me as a good addition with deliver us from evil, which in some languages is translated as deliver us from the evil one. Both deliver us from evil and deliver us from the evil one are legitimate translations of the Greek original. 27. When these things have been completed, the exorcist shows the troubled person the Lord's cross, which is the source of every blessing and grace. And the sign of the cross is made over the person by which Christ's power over the devil is shown. This is also like what's in the 1614 rite. 28. Finally, he says a deprecative formula, by which God is petitioned, as well as an imperative formula, by which the devil, in the name of Christ, is directly adjured to withdraw from the troubled person. The imperative formula is not to be used unless preceded by the deprecative formula. But the deprecative formula may also be used without the imperative one. Okay, so here is where the meat of the exorcism happens. First, like in the 1614 rite, there is a prayer to God to free the person. Then, also like in the 1614 rite, the devil is commanded to get out of the person. The difference is that the latter isn't a mandatory part of the rite, but it is a standard part of the rite. If you want to say it should be mandatory, that's fine with me. I'd be inclined to agree. But as we'll see, the passage commanding the demon to get out is quite confrontational. 29. All that has been mentioned above, to the extent necessary, may be repeated, either in the same celebration or at another time, until the troubled person is completely set free. 
This is like the 1614 rite, where the priest uses what he finds most effective against the demon and needs to continue using that until the person is completely free. 30. The rite is concluded with a canticle of thanksgiving, a prayer, and a blessing. And I think it's a, that's a good addition to the 1998 rite. The 1614 rite concluded with a prayer in which God was asked to keep protecting the free person, and exorcists may have voluntarily directed people to also make a prayer of thanksgiving after liberation had been achieved, but I think it's good to have prayers of thanksgiving as part of the rite itself. We now come to the fifth section of the introduction. What does it involve? It deals with circumstances for the rite and accommodations that may be made in it, and it repeats a lot of what's in the 1614 instructions. It says that the exorcist and the others should pray and fast. It says that the possessed person, if possible, should pray, practice mortification, profess the faith, and frequently go to confession and communion, and so should everyone who's helping the person. It says that, if possible, the exorcism should take place in an oratory away from a crowd, So not a church where you'd expect to have more outsiders coming in, but still an oratory, that is a chapel or designated place of prayer. And it says that there needs to be an image of Christ crucified there, as well as an image of the Virgin Mary. When it comes to adaptations within the rite, it says, 34. Keeping before his eyes the conditions and circumstances of the troubled person, the exorcist should freely use the various possibilities proposed in the rite. In the celebration, therefore, he should preserve the structure and arrange and select the formulas and prayers as needed, accommodating everything to the circumstances of the individual person. A. First of all, he should pay attention to the physical and psychological state of the troubled person, and to the possible variations in his or her state during the day, or even during an hour. B. When there is no assembly of the faithful, not even a small one, which prudence and the wisdom that comes from faith otherwise require, the exorcist should be mindful that in himself and in the troubled member of the faithful, the church is already present, and he should recall this to the memory of the troubled person. C. He should always see to it that the troubled member of the faithful, while being exorcised, should, if possible, Recollect himself or herself completely. Turn to God, and with a firm faith, beseech him for liberation with all humility. Even when the person is more violently troubled, let the person bear it patiently, in no way distrusting God's help through the ministry of the church. Much of this is straight out of the 1614 rite, which did, for example, urge the priest to talk to the possessed person about what he was feeling during the exorcism and adapt accordingly. It also said that the person should recollect himself, pray, and bear it patiently if he hit a really troubled patch. What's different is that the focus here is exclusively on the possessed person, not on the demon. Whereas, in the 1614 rite, the exorcist was directed to see what seemed to be hurting the demon most and then do more of that. You've proposed a theory that what makes exorcism work, or at least a significant part of what makes it work, is overloading the demon with holiness, including fear of what God will do to it in order to force it out. Do you think the new rite would be better if it retained this focus? I think that's certainly an arguable position, and just speaking personally, I would put more focus on punishing the demon if I were an exorcist, which I'm not. However, the church has not articulated a formal theory of what makes exorcism work, other than that it's by the power of God, so I think people could have different opinions on this issue, and you can still retain a particular focus on hurting the demon in the current rite, it's just that the exorcist isn't directed to do that. Now, the sixth and final section of the introduction covers adaptations to the rite that the Conference of Bishops can make. What do those include? Well, uh, preparing translations of the rite. Also, they can make further adaptations of the rite as long as they get the permission of the Holy See. And finally, if they choose, they can prepare a pastoral directory on the use of a major exorcism, which would discuss matters more fully and gather documents and opinions of experts. But they also need the approval of the Holy See to publish such a directory. 
You've noted that the new rite of exorcism doesn't mandate the same focus on punishing the demon to get it to leave. Is there anything else it omits that's notable? Yes, it leaves out all discussion of asking the demon questions. The introduction doesn't say anything about needing to ask the demon its name or when it will leave or anything else. And there are no points in the rite where the exorcist is directed to ask it anything. The entire focus is just on get the thing to leave, not asking it questions. However, there is one passage that could confuse people on this point, and it's the very last paragraph of section six of the introduction about things that the Conference of Bishops can do. It gives examples of what a pastoral directory might include, and it says, Documents from approved authors may be collected about the way of acting, speaking, questioning, and forming judgments. If you read that too quickly, you could think it's talking about questioning demons, but it's actually not, and the context indicates that that is not what's being discussed. You'll notice the ways of questioning comes after ways of acting and speaking and before forming judgments. That puts the questioning in a stage before the exorcism takes place, before the exorcism has formed a judgment about whether one is warranted. So the question in part is part of the preliminary investigation phase. That's why question in demons isn't mentioned. It's talking about how to question the troubled person and other witnesses to find out what they're experiencing and thus form a judgment about whether a demon is involved. So the current right does not envision question in demons. What do you think about that? Well, frankly, I think it's a good thing. Uh, Father Amorth used the old rite where the exorcist did tell the demon to obey him, and yet he acknowledged that the demons would regularly lie, even about who they were and what they when they would leave. He said that they, in his words, quote, rarely, close quote, gave the correct date. So experience has shown that demons can't be compelled to tell the truth, even about core things like their identity. They are lying liars who are working for the father of lies, and they lie. Furthermore, you don't need to get information like this out of the demon. Jesus only asked a demon its name one time. He didn't get a straight answer, and he expelled the demon anyway. And finally, as we'll cover in a future episode, the church got into huge trouble by exorcists asking demons questions and then believing what they said. That led to what's called clerical necromancy, which is a phenomenon we'll talk about in a future episode. And that's why the 1614 rite has a prohibition on asking demons unnecessary questions and says to pay no mind to anything else they say. What if an exorcist is using the 1614 rite and asks the demon just the core things, like its name and when it will leave? Well, if you're using the 1614 rite, you need to do that. That's what the rite says to do. And if the demon answers truthfully, that's good. It may be a sign you're making progress, but don't put a lot of weight on what it says because experience shows that they lie even in these circumstances, and we don't ultimately have a way of knowing which bits are true and which aren't. Before we close, are there any other parts of the current right that you'd like to cover? Yeah, I want to look briefly at the imperative formula. That's the one where the exorcist orders the demon to get out. Because that was one of the criticisms made of the New Right. You'll recall that John Thavis inaccurately summarized the New Right, saying that it just involves praying to God and asking the demon to leave instead of commanding it to leave. That is certainly not true of the current version of the Right. We won't quote the whole imperative formula here, but just to give you a sense of what it said, here are some excerpts from it just so you can see how confrontational it is and understand how false the charge made against the current right is. Among other things, the imperative formula says, I charge you, Satan, enemy of human salvation. Acknowledge the justice and goodness of God the Father, who by his righteous judgment has damned your pride and envy. Depart from this servant of God, name, whom the Lord has made in his own image adorned with his gifts, and adopted as a son of his mercy. Depart from this creature name, whom Christ by his birth made his brother, and by his death purchased with his blood. 
Go out from name, this creature of God, whom he has signed with a seal from on high. Depart from this man, whom God by spiritual anointing has made a holy temple. Depart therefore, Satan, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Depart through the faith and prayer of the church. Depart through the sign of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. So it's depart, 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 depart. Just get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. The idea that this new right has been defanged and you only ask the demon to leave is simply false. There are repeated commands to the demon to leave in the name of God. Now, that covers the main rite of exorcism itself. What else does the document contain? Chapter 2 contains various texts that can be used during the exorcism, including additional imperative formulas where, in a muscular fashion, the exorcist orders the demon to get out. There's even one where he tells the devil to shut up, saying, Be silent, father of lies, and hinder not this servant of God from blessing and praising the Lord. This is the command to you of Jesus Christ. After this chapter, there are two appendices. The first is a version of the 1890 exorcism that Pope Leo XIII wrote, especially for use when demons were affecting a community or a location. And interestingly, this one doesn't require a full exorcist. If the bishop chooses, an ordinary priest can do it. The rite is preceded by a note that says... The presence of the devil and other demons appears and exists not only in the tempting or tormenting of persons, but also in the penetration of things and places, in a certain manner by their activity, and in various forms of opposition to and persecution of the church. If the diocesan bishop, in particular situations, judges it appropriate to announce gatherings of the faithful for prayer under the leadership and direction of a priest, Elements for arranging a rite of supplication may be taken from the following. So you could use this in cases of things like infestation rather than possession, like when a demon is affecting a thing or a place, but it still needs to be a designated priest who says the key parts of the rite, not a member of the lay faithful or a deacon. Finally, we come to the second appendix, and this one consists of prayers that are actually for the lay faithful to pray. It's titled, Supplications Which May Be Used by the Faithful Privately in Their Struggle Against the Powers of Darkness. It's basically seven pages of deliverance prayers that lay people are authorized to say. And here in the U.S., the National Conference of Bishops has published it as a booklet. It's, the booklet is called Prayers Against the Powers of Darkness, and we'll have a link to it on Amazon, though last I checked, they didn't have it in stock. We won't go through this appendix here, though, because it's not part of the rite of major exorcism. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line about exorcism? Exorcism is a needed rite. It has its roots in the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus, it has taken on different forms in the history of Christianity, including in the Latin Church, which has seen different forms of exorcism over time. The Latin Church currently has two rites of exorcism. The first was published in 1614 and has subsequently been modified, and the second, which was based on the 1614 rite, was first published in 1998. To my mind, both rites have advantages and disadvantages, but both are effective in getting demons out of people which is a service that, at least in some cases, is truly needed because demons do possess people, and when that happens, they need God's deliverance. Fortunately, that deliverance is available today through the church's ministry of exorcism. And what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have a link to Adam Bly's The History of Exorcism and John Thavis's book, The Vatican Prophecies. We'll also have a link to the booklet, Prayers Against the Powers of Darkness, which hopefully will be in stock if you want to get it. We'll also have links to the 1985 norms from the CDF, also a Q&A from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops on Exorcism, the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on exorcism, as well as on uh, on an, what an exorcist is, on demonic possession, on demoniacs, and on demonology. We'll have a web archive of the older Roman ritual, which includes the rite of exorcism. And we'll have a link to, the 19, to a 1975 
uh, expert opinion piece on demonology that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, commissioned. Excellent. And now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about exorcism? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work in this episode. You can check it out by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, you can help me grow the channel. I'm trying to get to 100,000, which is a key moment for all YouTubers. Um, They even give you a special award when you hit 100,000. So I'm trying to get there. You can help me by uh, liking, commenting, writing a review, sharing the podcast, and especially by subscribing. And when you do that, be sure and hit the bell notification so you always get notified when I have a new video. And I'd like to thank Craig Hart for his voiceover work in today's episode. So Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be talking about a strange case from 1950s Japan. Reportedly, a man arrived on a plane at an airport in Tokyo, but when he presented his passport, it said he came from a country called Taured. The Japanese officials had never heard of this country, so they asked him to point it out on a map. He pointed to a region on the border of France and Spain that in our world is known as Andorra. But the man had never heard of Andorra, and he was astonished that Taured wasn't there. So next week, we'll be telling you the story of the man from Taured and looking at whether he might, in fact, be a visitor from a parallel world. Very interesting. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. Get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, mug, and more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 342. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by... The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Join a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go on pilgrimage to the mysterious shrines and sites of Italy in the Jubilee year 2025 with Jimmy Aiken and me, Dom Bettinelli. Go with us on a 12-day, all-inclusive tour that gives you incredible access to Jimmy's insights in Rome, Assisi, Orvieto, Monte Cassino, San Giovanni Rotundo, the Grotto of St. Michael, and more. We're also planning special activities like recording on location for future episodes of Mysterious World and an in-person Weird Questions episode just for pilgrims. Space is limited and filling up, so be sure to find out more. Visit mysterious.fm slash Italy 2025 to reserve your spot today. That's mysterious.fm slash Italy 2025. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.